I'm going to go straight into my sermon rather than have the Bible reading first. But I'm going to start by reading a poem which was published in Christianity Today a while ago. It's anonymous, but it's great. I think it's lovely. There's a very busy person called somebody else. There's nothing that they cannot do. They're busy from morning till late at night, just substituting for you. When asked to do this or asked to do that, so often you're set to reply, get somebody else, Mr. Chairman. They'll do it much better than I. There's so much to do in our church, so much, and the workers are few. And somebody else gets weary and worn, just substituting for you. So next time you're asked to do something worthwhile, come up with this honest reply. If somebody else can give time and support, it's obviously true. So can I. I thought that was really good. I like that. Now, as I said, this was sent anonymously. But whoever wrote it is quite right, aren't they? Somebody else is an extremely popular person. It's someone we all know, but we can't quite exactly place. In God's kingdom, we're all called to serve. So why don't we? Are we disinterested or lazy? Or do we just think we haven't got anything to offer? Well, I've got news for you folks. We can't use that excuse. We've all got something to offer. Because God will equip us for everything, whatever we need to do. So let's see now what today's reading has to say about this. It's... Exodus 31, verses 1 to 11. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all I have commanded of you, the tent of meeting, and the ark of testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils, and the pure lampstand with all its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand, and the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and garments for his sons for their service as priests, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place. According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. Now God's already given instructions on how the tabernacle and its furniture are to be built, but craftsmen are needed to do all this. But where are they to come from? Earlier in Exodus, we read that the Hebrews made bricks, didn't we, when they were working in Egypt, or they kept animals. So it's probably more than likely that there was no one among them who'd been to fine art school who had any of these skills, let alone all of them. But of course, that doesn't bother God. He's got his own plans. He has called Bezalel, and through the Holy Spirit, he has filled him with ability, intelligence, knowledge, and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs and work in gold, silver, and bronze. God has also called Aholiab and given him the same gifts. In fact, God had given everyone the ability that would enable them 
to create the necessary items. Now, the tribe of Dan wasn't a particularly holy tribe. They weren't in the, the hierarchy of the land. They weren't in the priestly or leadership echelons. In fact, David gave us some notes for these sermons, and his note on this one, he says that it would be like God appointing a third division footballer to the premiership. Under normal circumstances, they would be completely out of their depth. But these weren't normal circumstances. You notice they have been called by God. God called each one of them. And so they have been equipped by him through the work of the Holy Spirit. And just as an aside, this is the third time the Holy Spirit has been mentioned in the Old Testament. The very first is at the beginning of Genesis in verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And again in Genesis 41, when Pharaoh appoints Joseph as governor, he says, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? When we become Christians, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives to help us to get to know God more, to help us to pray, to help us to do God's work. So although we may think somebody else would do the job better, God might act not actually have equipped them to do that task. He might well have equipped us instead. If we believe that we're living our lives in and through God, then the Holy Spirit is also at work in us, empowering us. If you notice the type of work that God has called Bezalel and Aholiab and their co-workers to do, first they have to create artistic designs for all the items that God has demanded. Then they have to be able to work in gold, silver, bronze and wood. There are utensils to go on the furniture that they also have to make. And there's needlework to make fine garments. And there are oils and incense to make. Now, there's some very big jobs there, aren't there? And there are some very small jobs. But each one of those jobs has been asked for by God. And each one is just as important as the other. What would be the point of the tabernacle if there were no utensils? if there were no oils or incense to burn, if there were no garments for the priests to wear. There are no small tasks in God's kingdom. He appreciates each one as much as the other. And I'm going to repeat that because I think that's something we often forget, don't we? There are no small tasks in God's kingdom. He appreciates each one as much as the other. We might not be building the Ark of the Covenant or the Tabernacle here at St. Thomas's, but we are building God's church. And God is equipping each one of us to do that. And we must remember then that each one of us is important. Who's on coffee duty today? Anne, Anne, oh, my name, Colin and Sue. So, do you think that I'm more important than them this morning because I'm standing up here leading and preaching? Certainly not. No, thanks, Jim. I knew I could rely on you. Well, just to confirm what Jim said, no, I'm not. In fact, when I've finished, I shall be gasping for a cuppa and there won't be anything more important than that and the people who have made it. So, thank you in advance. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks of the church as a body with many parts. I'm just going to read you some of his words. It's verse 12 and then verses 14 to 22. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, 
though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong in the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the, in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. As we look to the future of our journey here at St Thomas's, as we will be doing next Sunday, it's vitally important that we're all part of it, that we're all involved, and that we all play our part because the body doesn't function without you. How can we find out, though, what gifts we have? I'm not talking about highfalutin spiritual gifts. I'm thinking about everyday gifts, the things that God will be using to help us um, enlarge his kingdom here. Well, one way is to think about the things we're good at and to see if and how God is wanting us to use these in some way. Now, just as an example, if you can knit or sew, why not join the Knit and Natter group? Not got time, don't feel like it. But just think, there might be someone in that group who is waiting for you to sit next to them. Perhaps to show them what to do or just to have a chat, they might need you. And that seems very mundane, doesn't it? I knit every day, much to Max's disgust, but I do. But it's important, isn't it, that any small thing, you might not think it's anything to go to that group, but for that one person it might be. Another way to find out what you're good at is to ask people around you because they are actually more likely to see the gifts in you than you are yourself. And you might actually be surprised at what they say. And then, of course, you can always pray that God will show you what he wants you to do. You might find that you're amazing at doing something new. And if you feel God prompting you, just give it a try. It might be something you never thought you could do but try it instead. But however you find your gifts, please don't ever think you won't be good enough. Because if God wants you to use that gift, he will equip you through his spirit to minister in just the right way. Now, I believe that one of my gifts is words. I like words, I like writing. I like writing sermons and services and things like that. I would quite like to be the sort of bouncing around vicar that David is, you know, seemingly no notes, just wandering over here and wandering over there. But without my notes, I would forget everything because I forget my name if I don't see it regularly. So God hasn't equipped me to be that sort of preacher Yet he has equipped me to be this sort of preacher, which is where I'm happy and where I'm confident. But I would never have been a preacher if I hadn't tried it in the first place. So just listen to what God wants you to do 
and step out in faith because if it is what he wants you to do, then he will equip you to do it. We need never be afraid of serving God. I'm going to repeat that as well. We need never be afraid of serving God. Just open yourself to him. Allow him to work through you. You might not be asked to build a temple or an ark. Well, perhaps you might. Do we need a new shed, Sue? <laughs> you might just be asked to chat to someone or bake a cake. But how big or how small your ministry might be, just open your heart to God and serve him. God needs you. And if you do that, you might be giving our friend somebody else a bit of a rest. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you give us so many things, that you give each one of us gifts. And Lord, we, we're sorry for the times when we haven't used those gifts, for the times when we have ignored your voice in our ear, encouraging us. Father God, help us to know how to serve you as we seek to move on here at St. Thomas's. Ask each one of us what you will, not what we would like to do, but what you want us to do. So, Father God, we give ourselves, our gifts, our time, our service to you, in your name. Amen. Before I 